We all just got our dose of the gospel, didn't we? I love that. The gospel in one song floats my boat. Right. I got to catch my breath. That was so good. You know, we're, we've been comparing Christianity to other faiths. So let me just say this. Not only do we have the only true and living God, but we have the best music too. Amen? Yeah. That is good stuff. That is just good stuff. Amen. Who else? shows up this early on a Sunday morning just to have a concert, right? <laughs> Christians, we got something to celebrate, something to be happy about. And so uh, welcome again to Huntington Beach Church. I hope you're tuning in online and seeing what's going on. I hope it could be an encouragement to you and uh, as much as it is to us who are here in person. And again, if you haven't checked in already, please check in on the app or on the website. And you can also open up our sermon notes that are available to you on the app. If you go to uh, today's message, you, you'll find it there. And, uh, and then also there's a place for you to have online giving. And so all, everything is there and available and easy for you to, to, uh, to engage this morning and uh, support what's going on and to, to interact with us. And also, again, I just want to say something about we're out trying to reach people for Christ. That's what Huntington Beach Church is all about. We're about sharing the gospel uh, with people. And we have a team of people here. We call it Team 153. And they're all about evangelism. They're all about going even door to door in our neighborhood, the old fashioned way, and, uh, which they haven't done in a year because of COVID. But uh, we're going to be kicking that back off soon. And uh, if you'd like to be part of a team that really just um, uh, is, is intentionally evangelistic and creatively evangelistic, uh, Team 153 is for you. Uh, they're the ones that sponsor our drive through prayer ministries and, uh, and other sorts of things. We've put on all sorts of very fun events. In fact, if uh, someone to talk to this morning, Lisa and Jose, I'm going to just point you out this morning right here on the third row. We love Lisa and Jose. They're one of the uh, leaders in that team and so after service if you want to get more information Lisa and Jose raise your hand Jose don't look at me like that brother like <laughs> like what's he calling my name out for now, these are wonderful godly wonderful people that love people and love the Lord Jesus Christ they can give you more information about this team we need to recruit some people all right here's the thing in the last year we've lost some recruits and uh, or some recruits are on hold on standby waiting until things uh, kind of get a little uh, better in their situations. So we need more recruits out there if we're going to get the gospel out, especially now leading up to Easter and making sure that this community knows that we're open and uh, we're here for them. And so that's what that's all about. All right, with that said, I want us to jump into today's message. Last week, last week I talked to you about how to share the good news of the gospel with a Hindu friend. And I compared Hinduism and Christianity. Here is a, a review of what I talked about last week. That Hinduism believes in an impersonal divinity that is basically a force. It's not a God like we think of a, a God being a person. But in Hinduism, God is a force. And you've heard of the force if you've watched Star Wars, and that's where they got the concept from. That force, and the force is called Brahman. 
in comparison to that, Christianity believes that Jesus Christ is the one true and living God, and he loves us. He's personal. He knows us. He is a person. You can meet God. God has made himself known. He's real, and there's only one God. Not everything's God, not a force that encompasses everything. There's only one God, and we, we know his name, Jesus Christ. And uh, number two, Hinduism believes that every creature is divine, that everything emanates from that force, and so therefore there is a, there is a, a, a divinity inside of everything. But we Christians know that we are not divine. We will never be divine. We are sinners, right? We are sinners in need of a Savior. We, we are not divine. We're not gods. We can never become gods. We never were gods. We understand that. Hinduism also teaches that by improving one's karma, and karma is all the good things versus bad things that you've done. So karma is the accumulation of good and evil deeds. And if you can improve that accumulation and get good karma, then you, you can be enlightened. And enlightenment means that you realize that you are divine and you stop sinning. And that is the way of salvation. And, and, and Hindus believe that nobody really figures that out the first go-round. So when you die and you come back, you're reincarnated. And a, maybe as a human, maybe as an animal or something like that. But you keep living a life until you get it right. When you get enlightened, then you break that cycle of reincarnation. Whereas we believe that you only have one life to live. And we're sinners in need of a Savior. And that Jesus Christ is God and he saves us by his grace. You can't earn salvation. You can't work on it and become perfect and all of a sudden deserve salvation or earn it or enter into this force or whatever. But no, you need a Savior. And thankfully, God is filled with grace and mercy. And that's how he saves us, based on his grace. Because he paid for our sins on the cross. And so that was last week. That was that's sort of a, a review of last week. And we're talking about, last week, Hinduism, which was an Eastern religion, is an Eastern religion, originating in India and China and Japan and Southeast Asia. And there's other Eastern religions like Jainism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, on and on I could go. But today... In particular, I want to focus on another one called Buddhism. Buddhism. And I want to explain it to you and give you some tips at the end of the message on how to witness to a Buddhist friend. Because I know many of you have Buddhist friends. There are many Buddhists that live here in California. And one of the big reasons for that is because we have such a, a migrant population from these Buddhist countries in Asia. In fact, I, a couple of years ago, taught in a high school in Anaheim, and the vast majority of the children in the high school were Buddhist. And guess what? We were in a Christian high school. It was a Christian school. And, uh, but the, the families overseas wanted to send their children to a safe school, so they sent them to a Christian school in America, and they were okay with that. They were okay that we were Christians and uh, you'll learn why it was okay and why they could ac actually, it didn't bother them that we were Christians. So anyway, we were, I met just all those young people that were Buddhists. And, and it really opened my eyes up to just how many Buddhists live here in our communities. And we love them. And God loves them. And the gospel is for them. Amen? And so we want to talk about that this morning and give you wisdom and insight on how to share the love of Christ with your Buddhist friends. And here's the key. Hinduism informs Buddhism. Hinduism informs Buddhism. Buddhism came out of Hinduism. Buddhism is, is almost, you could say, a form of Hinduism. It's just got, Buddhism's got a, a few more rules and, and a little more theology, you might even say. So Hinduism informs Buddhism. So really, if you're tuning in this week for the first time, 
You might need afterwards at some point this week, go back and listen to last week's message, and it'll really be a primer for this message today. Now, many of us are familiar with a little bit with Buddhism and Buddha himself, right? And uh, Buddha was a gentleman who went on a spiritual search in order to find the cause of suffering and how to best eliminate it. His name wasn't originally Buddha. It was Siddhartha Gautama. And Siddhartha Gautama went on this spiritual journey and he wanted to figure out the key to, to life and eternity. And again, he felt like that life was all about suffering and salvation was learning how to eliminate suffering. Now what he did was he first went out and, and tried extreme pleasure. He just did everything that made him happy. It felt, if it felt good, he did it to see if he could eliminate suffering in his life. It didn't work. So then he tried something else. He said, well, I will go the opposite direction. And he tried extreme asceticism. Asceticism is whenever you deprive yourself of all pleasure. He deprived himself of pleasure, comfort, many times even deprived himself of food. But that didn't work either. And here is what he claimed then, after all of this research, is the way of salvation. The way of salvation from a life of suffering. He, it, it, it came to him that there were, as he called it, four noble truths. And you can write these in your notes. Four noble truths. That if you understand and believe and, and embrace these truths, and they really become a part of you, this is your way of salvation. Number one, he said life is full of suffering. That was noble truth number one. You have to believe that life is full of suffering, pain and suffering. Number two, suffering is caused by desire. Desire for pleasure, desire for existence, just to have a desire. Think about that now. Just to desire, to desire anything is going to cause you to suffer. I'll explain what he meant by that in a moment, but just think about that. The concept of just desiring something, anything is going to cause you to suffer. So he said, number three, the way to liberate yourself from suffering, this is logical, is to eliminate all desire. Now, if this isn't making sense to you, I understand because of our way of thinking. But if you go back and you build on what we talked about last week with Hinduism and bring it into today, it, you're going to catch on pretty quickly when, you, when you're reminded that Hinduism, which informs Buddhism, believes that everything in this life that we're living in the flesh is an illusion. That the only real thing is the force. Brahman, force. And the force is, is the only real thing. And so we're in existence, detached somewhat from the force. We're not fully back in the force yet. So we're living this existence of trying to get back into the force. And so therefore, what we're living is not real. It's an illusion. But if we start, watch this, desiring what we're living, then we're going to suffer. Because what we're living is an illusion. We should only desire the force. So if we desire what we're living, if we have any cravings for anything in this world or this life or this body or whatever, you're going to suffer because this world, this life, your body will never satisfy you because it's an illusion. You see the logic? So life is full of suffering. Suffering is caused by desire. So the only way to liberate yourself from suffering is to learn how to stop desiring. And you say, well, now how in the world do I stop desiring? Well, that leads to the fourth noble truth of Buddhism, and that is desire can be eliminated by the noble eightfold path. 
What is the Noble Eightfold Path? I'm going to give you the eight things in the Noble Eightfold Path. And if you've got the notes right now, you're thanking me because I already wrote them down for you. But if you're writing them down the old-fashioned way on a piece of paper, write quickly. Here's the Eightfold Path of that fourth step, that fourth Noble Truth. The Eightfold Path is, number one, right views. You've got to have right, if you're going to eliminate desire, you've got you to believe the truth accurately and reliable. And what is the truth? The truth, according to Buddhism, is the four noble truths, all right? So you've got to believe those four noble truths. That's truth. So if you believe that, the four noble truths, believe them accurately and reliably, that's going to help you to eliminate desire. Number two, right thought. And what they mean by right thought is no impure thoughts, no impure motives. Now, let's let that sink in for a moment. You can never have an impure thought, not just impure action. You can't even have an impure thought if you're going to reach salvation. Number three, right speech. One must have no unloving speech or communication. You can never say anything wrong or with the wrong motive. You must have right action, meaning you can do nothing immoral, can never make any mistakes or do anything wrong. You got to have right livelihood, meaning one must not hurt anyone. This is why many Buddhists are very pacifist. They are trying their best not to hurt anyone for any reason. Then there's right effort. One must never lose control physically, mentally, emotionally. You must always be in control of everything in you. Never lose control in any area of your life. Number seven, right mindfulness. One must be aware of all of their feelings. Let's camp right there for a moment. You got to be aware of all of your feelings. This is what led to the extreme meditation practices of Buddhism. Because you got to really get in touch with every feeling inside your soul. This is why they practice that. It's part of the way. You have to do this in order to be enlightened. And then right meditation. One must... Now here's, here's the ultimate end of their meditation. Cease thinking. I know that sounds silly to us. I'm not trying to make fun. This is their rules, so I'm not trying in any way to belittle them, but it does seem impossible, does it not? In fact, it seems dangerous. Stop thinking, and they say, therefore, your mind can rest. Remember, the goal is to stop suffering. So if you can just stop thinking and feeling and doing anything, and saying anything. You see, you see where this is going? And you'll notice the little wheel over here. That's called the wheel of Dharma. Represents the eightfold uh, uh, path. You see the eight spokes. It's also known as the wheel of life and the wheel of transformation. And so this symbol, this, this wheel, is the symbol of Buddha. Whereas in Christianity we may have a cross... Buddhists, they have several symbols, but this is one of the most popular because it represents this eightfold path. Now, all of this is salvation in their language is to get you to nirvana. Not the band, but a state of existence. Yeah, if you could get to nirvana, the band, some of y'all would sign up right now, right? Like That's your group, maybe? All right. We're talking about a place of existence, a mindset. And here's what it means. To be liberated from the endless cycle of death and rebirth by eliminating all desire. All attachment to the illusion of self. So if you want to get out of this endless cycle of needing to be reincarnated and try again and try again and try again until you live a perfect life or reach a perfect life somehow, uh, the only way is to go through these, believe the truths, go through 
the noble path, the eightfold path, and you reach this state of nirvana. Now, Buddhism has many branches and versions. Because the theology that I just laid out to you, and that is their theology, because that's the way they defined the spiritual life and quote-unquote God or divinity, that's their theology. Because it is so uh, inconsistent in some ways, impossible in some ways, that, that many people have made different versions of it. And it, and it ends up there's many, many branches of Buddhism. And so some of you may have heard of Zen Buddhist. They're the ones that practice the rigorous efforts of meditation. Again, that's to explore their own minds and their own feelings. And it's a very rigorous practice. So those are Zen Buddhists. Maybe you've heard of the Tibetan Buddhists. The leader of the Tibetan Buddhists is the Dalai Lama. I've got a picture of the current Dalai Lama here on the screen. Uh, he is what is called in Buddhism the Bodhisattva, which means that Buddhists believe that this man, the Dalai Lama, is actually a person who got enlightened and could have entered nirvana but because this person was so compassionate, they decided not to enter nirvana, but stick around and help the rest of us get enlightened. That's what the Dalai Lama is. The Dalai Lama is a person who has already achieved enlightenment and could go on to nirvana, but has chosen not to to help us. In fact, they believe this Dalai Lama is the 14th reincarnation of the original Dalai Lama. So they don't know who, when, when this gentleman passes away, they don't know who the next one will be. There's a whole ceremony and way that they figure that out. But they believe that the Dalai Lama continues to stick around through reincarnation to help the world get enlightened. Maybe you've heard of that. You see, Buddhism is very popular among Americans. Last week I talked to you about Hinduism. I, don't think any of you could even, even, many of you even know a Hindu or could name a famous Hindu besides maybe one or two at the most. But Buddhism is totally different. Buddhism has many famous celebrities and different types of people in different walks of life that become Buddhists. Just to name celebrities, since everybody knows celebrities, like Jennifer Aniston and Orlando Bloom and Kate Bosworth and David Bowie and Jeff Bridges and Richard Greer, Greer and Goldie Hawn and Kate Hudson and Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Lopez and Brad Pitt and Keanu Reeves and Steven Seagal, and Sting and Uma Thurman and Tina Turner and yes, Tiger Woods, famous practicing Buddhist. And then, then there's the fictitious Buddhists, the Buddhists that are in the movies that practice Buddhism in the movies like Enigma from the Marvel comics and Zorn of X-Men and Green Arrow of the DC comics, these things are presented to the public in a way that it becomes easier and easier to embrace this religion. It makes you think, why do people think Buddhism is so attractive? What is it about Buddhism? that it's so attractive. When you think about the monks and the monasteries and the temples and the shrines and karma and reincarnation and Star Wars and the matrix and yoga and meditation, all of this allure, what is it about this that just seems to draw people, especially Americans, into it? Could it be that Buddhism is a soft landing for atheists? Seriously? Could it be? A soft landing for atheists? In other words, you know, if you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, atheism is just not really popular. Because the reality is all humans, we know this as Christians, are created in the image of God. And so there is this 
spirituality to us. And you may be agnostic and say, well, there's a God, but we, we don't really know him, you know, or can't communicate with him. That's kind of ag- agnosticism. But atheism, you know, is there's, there's no God person. There's no supreme being. That's atheism. It's just not popular. It just really goes against the, the nature of humanity to even believe that, right? So where do you go as an atheist? Many of them go toward Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, God's not a person or a supreme being. It's just that force. It's just, you know, something out there once we die or we're, we're done living, it's where we go. And because of that, because, because of all the celebrity and all of the movies and all of the depictions of it just being this real cool stuff, you know, that it's really a... a it's more cool to be a Buddhist than an atheist. It's just a soft landing. It's more hip, you might say. It's more in a mainstream. So there's a big alert that's out there, a huge alert. And also, I would add to that, that it feels spiritual. I mean, could it be that it just feels so spiritual that it draws people in? I mean, from the Tibetan mountaintop monasteries and the shaved heads and the flowing orange robes and the exotic locations and the meditation and all of that promise of experiencing the the oneness of the force. It just, I don't know, on the the outside, it, it, it just looks spiritual, doesn't it? It just has that feeling of pure religion. I think it does, especially the way it's depicted in media and movies, that it becomes an allure to people who are wanting to be spiritual. But here's the other thing. I believe it has an allure because at the end of the day, it's empty of real accountability. It's actually a pretty easy religion to get into and practice. And it has no real accountability. In in other words, you don't really have to join anything. You can just claim to be a Buddhist. Maybe this week your daughter will tell you that she's Buddhist. You're like, what? Where did that come from? It can happen. You you can just join it. You can just become one. You You don't even have to call yourself Buddhist. You, what you, you can do, and this is where young people get into it, that it you, you just begin to present yourself as this calm, deep-thinking pacifist. And everybody loves that, especially in this snowflake generation, amen? Just calm, I just want peace, world peace, Right? There's an alert to that. You follow me? I'm not, again, I'm not making fun of I'm showing you the enticement of it, why it's so easy for so many people to get into it. Christianity, on the other hand, is calls people to accountability. Christianity has a, a, a set of objective doctrines that we say, listen, if you're really a Christian, you, you believe these doctrines. It's and if you're, you don't believe these doctrines, you're, you're heretical. You're actually anti-Christian. You see, it's very, Christianity is much more rigid when you compare it to these other religions. In fact, Christianity calls you to live a life of submission and obedience to God in a relationship with God where His Holy Spirit will walk with you every moment And as God walks with you and lives with you as a Christian, he's actually working on you, sanctifying you. And if you're a Christian, you know that sanctifying process is not very easy, is it? God has a way of knocking you down and wiping you out and breaking you apart to rebuild you back together over and over again spiritually as a person to make you stronger and stronger, all in this life, amen? All in this life. We agree with the Buddhists. Life is full of suffering, right? And we Christians see that and we feel that. And we know that a lot of times it's God himself 
who is ordaining suffering in our life. But we know the payoff is great. Because walking with God, there's forgiveness and grace and joy and hope and eternal life. We know that what he's doing in us, even though it's hard, is he's getting rid of the bad stuff, the sin, right? He's getting rid of that stuff and making us more like the person he created us to be to glorify him. So we believe the payoff is good. But for many people, they can't get past the commitment. Here's the bottom line. People naturally do not want to obey God. That's just the way we're born. In our sin nature, we don't want to obey God. We would rather be God. And so the allurement of Buddhism becomes so strong because Buddhists teach that you are God. You are divine. Hinduism is the same way. You are divine. Now, see, that's way more appealing to the human nature. To find out that our body is an illusion, our life is an illusion, all the things that we're doing, they don't really have any meaning, they're an illusion. And all we need to do is be freed from this life of suffering and get in touch with our own divinity, which means to be enlightened, which means finally I can go to nirvana. Amen? And so here's the choices. Obey God or become God. Which one do you want to do? Obey God or become God? Now, it's something to think about. You see, I want you to write this down. There's so much I could say about this statement that I'm not going to be able to this morning, but it's something you need to just get into your thoughts, and that is a person can really only hold one worldview at a time. There's a Christian worldview based on biblical doctrine. And if you're a Christian, you're developing that worldview. The more you learn about the Bible, the more you learn about Christ, that worldview which is established in the scriptures, you're developing it in your heart. And it should be the only worldview that you hold because it's an exclusive world. Christianity is an exclusive worldview. I mean, it's a set of truths that that are exclusive. Right? So the more you develop that Christian worldview and believe it, you can really only hold one worldview at a time. That's why there's all, the world's always throwing alternative worldviews at you, whether in the form of false religions or philosophies, or even like right now there's the whole woke movement. That is in and of itself a worldview that redefines everyone's identity and the purpose of life and, and how to be successful and happy. And so, Right? The de- definition of justice, the definition of everything, because it's a worldview. So I'm, I bring up wokeness just to show you how pervasive the strategy of the evil one is to present to you constantly new worldviews. And you'll get tempted and alert to pull it into your life. Maybe even try to attach it to your current worldview. But the reality is, is you can't attach a false worldview to Christianity. Christianity is exclusive. You can only either be Christian or not Christian. Or let me be even more plain spoken for this message's sake. You cannot be a Christian Buddhist. You cannot. And I literally am saying that because some people claim that. You cannot be a Christian Buddhist. The two worldviews are incompatible. In fact, let me give you some more theology behind Buddhism. I'm going to go through these rather quickly. They're all in your notes. You can write them down as fast as you can. The theology. First of all, monism. Monism is a theory that sees all reality as a unified whole. By now, you should be aware of this concept, right? It's called in Hinduism and Buddhism, the force, Brahman. That everything emanates from the force. So therefore, in theory, everything that we call reality, that to them is really an illusion, but all of this that we see and feel and touch is part of a unified whole. That's monism, which leads me to the next 
point of theology, excuse me, make sure I get the right one here, pantheism. Oh, I didn't write that one on my screen. You have to take my word for it. Pantheism is the view that God is all and all is God. God is all and all is God. I'm looking through my notes here. I don't see it. I don't have a slide for you. Pantheism. Pantheism. You might think of pantheism as there's many gods. And the reason there's many gods in pantheism is because all is God and and God is all. This is at the root of Hinduism and Buddhism. In pantheism, therefore, God is impersonal and even amoral because God is not the supreme being that is above us. He's, he's actually in us, all of us. We're all divine. Now, think logically through that. If all are divine, then there is no such thing as divine. That's a logic statement. You've got to think through it. If we're all God, then there is no God. Because there would be nothing above us, which is our understanding of godness. A being above us. But if we are all God, then, then there's nothing above us. Therefore, now watch this logic. Therefore, there is no God Therefore, it is a form of atheism. To believe we're all God is a form of atheism. It's a very alluring, tricky form of atheism, but it is one used very successfully by the devil. And that's why I said Buddhism is a soft landing for atheists. If everything is divine, then logically nothing is divine, which leads me to this next one. i got a slide for Eclecticism and religious syncretism. Eclecticism is to draw from various sources of truth. Whereas we Christians believe that the Bible is the infallible, inerrant revelation of God about life and godliness and that the Bible is complete, the Bible is sufficient, we don't have to go elsewhere to other sources to learn about God and living for God. We can go to the Bible. Any other source out there better be based on the Bible. Amen? But a Buddhist believes that you can find truth in multiple, from multiple sources, even if those sources contradict each other. That's eclecticism which is connected to religious syncretism. Religi religious syncretism is to combine the different and even contradictory religious and philosophical philosophies. So you, you, you go to different sources, even if those sources contradict each other, you draw from all those sources, and then you combine them together. That's syncretism. This is why, here's a footnote here, very important that you pick up on this. If you want to witness to a Buddhist friend, you need to remember this. They are okay with you believing in Jesus. In fact, they will believe in Jesus. As long as they can add him to their Buddhism. This is why I told you the students that I was teaching Many of their parents didn't mind that they went to a Christian school because they thought that might actually help improve their lives. If they add a little bit of that Christian doctrine into their life, it might even improve their morality, which they need to live perfectly. You see what I'm getting at? So anything you can do to help my Buddhism, I will embrace it even if it comes from your religion. Buddhists believe that God actually revealed himself through Jesus. They embraced Jesus along with Buddha and Krishna and many other, other people and the studies of holistic sciences and astrology. They just add it all together. Which brings me to the next theological point and that is the esoteric interpretation of truth. Esoteric means that, that truth is a mystery. 
They believe truth is a mystery that can only be understood by certain people. And it's only actually meant to be understood by a select few that have a special knowledge. That's what esoteric means. That truth is, is a mystery. So therefore, even when you deal with the Bible, if you're witnessing to a friend, they believe that the Bible is filled with symbols and hidden truths. Hidden truths and symbols that cannot be understood unless you are a special person. How many movies have you seen that where the Bible is filled with some weird codes, right? That are these ancient codes and you have to be some special uh, intellectual person to, to know the Bible. They're, they're trying to redefine what the Bible... The Bible is not given to us by God to be something we can't understand. It's a revelation from God. God gave us this book so we can understand it. Now, yes, it's filled with symbols and parables. We, we, we admit that. There's some symbols and parables in the Bible. But here's what we also know, is that the Bible always interprets itself. If there's any symbol or any parable in the Bible, just keep reading, it will interpret it for you. Do you understand that? There's nothing in the Bible that is a mystery that is left a mystery for you not to understand unless it's simply talking about, you know, the nature of God himself, because it explains it really well, but it's still over our heads, amen? Because God himself is just beyond us understanding. But everything else in the Bible, with all of his symbols and all of that, the Bible is actually rather easy to understand. A child can pick up the Bible and read it and understand it. It doesn't take a special holy guru person with some special powers or insights. And I'm telling you, this is very, very important because in Buddhism, that's exactly what you need in your religious books. And that's why in this, a religion like Buddhism, you have all of these very special people that they put up, the Dalai Lama and others, that they put up on these pedestals because you believe that you got to have this expert to interpret truth for you. And so then you end up paying homage to the one who has the secret codes. And so my dear brothers and sisters, I warn you, don't fall for that scam. Don't fall for that scam. Christians, don't fall for that even among Christianity. Because there's a lot of Christian scam artists out there that will make you think that they have a secret or a code that nobody else has ever seen. They're lying. God gave you this book and he gave you the Holy Spirit to teach you this book. And you don't need anybody, including me. Amen? God not only gave us his book, he gives us himself. We not only got the book, we got the author. Amen? And the author will teach you this book. And it will teach you everything you need to know to live for God and to be saved. So let me move on to another statement of theology, and that is the deification of humanity. Buddhism teaches that a human is saved when a human becomes enlightened to one's own deity and self-worth. The way of salvation is through reincarnation and karma until you are enlightened and enter nirvana. They will even say that Jesus was a man. They'll say, yes, he was a man. We believe in Jesus. But their view of Jesus is that he was a man just like me and you, except he got enlightened. And Jesus became one who embraced his divinity like you and I should. See, that's how they view him. So you got to be careful when you're talking to a Buddhist. You start talking about Jesus, they're shaking their head with you. And then you're like, oh man, I'm making progress. But no, the definitions are very different. You need to know that. Which brings me to the tips. I wanted to end this morning with the tips. And you've gotten a lot so far, but I'm going to just wrap these up pretty quickly. Like the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, when he went into Athens and began to deal with people from different religions, 
I think you need to find common ground when you talk to a person about the gospel, especially a person in a different religion like Buddhism. you got to find some common ground. So let me give you some common ground where you can begin your conversation with a Buddhist. For example, you can talk about goodness. You can say, listen, we both believe that we should live good and peaceful lives, right? If you have a Buddhist friend, you can talk about that, and you're going to be on the same page, and you're going to build a, a good conversation around the fact that Buddhism teaches you to live a good life, Christianity teaches you to live a good life, and I've given you scripture up there for that. The second thing you can talk about is hope. A, a Buddhist has hope. Their hope is in nirvana. Ours is in heaven. But we both have an eternal destination. That's something in common. We're both trying to get to that eternal destination. And so it's a common ground that you can talk about. In our Bible, in the book of Revelation, it gives a beautiful description of heaven at the end of the Bible. And you can even talk about that if you want to. And how it describes that place where all these humans are with God for all of eternity in its paradise. The third thing you can talk about is truth. See, both we Christians and a Buddhist believe that salvation is based on truth. Now, for us, truth is an objective truth. For them, truth is defined by the noble truths that I've given you, those four noble truths and then the eightfold path that follows. So they believe that the noble truths are true and accurate and reliable, where we believe the Bible is true and accurate and reliable, right? So we both have that in common. We're both dealing with a set of truths we think is the truth. But here's the issue. If you get into that conversation and we're both agreeing that you have a set of truths and I have a set of truths, wouldn't it be true then, wouldn't it be logically accurate that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And I have found that Buddhists will agree with you on that. If you just take those truths as objective truths into the story, they are contradictory. So one's right, one's wrong. And here's what I always say. Listen, if you are right and I am wrong, It doesn't matter. If the Buddhist is right and I, the Christian, am wrong, it doesn't really matter. I'll just get to come back again and try again. But if I'm right, you see where I'm going with this? So your eternal salvation is at stake because I believe you've only got one life to live. And that makes this a very important conversation, which is why I have a compassion for you and a burden for you. It's why I'm praying for you. It's why I want to have this uncomfortable conversation with you. Because if this book is right, it matters, friend. It matters. leads to this next one, suffering, common ground. We both believe in suffering. Here's the thing, Eastern religions teach that there's nothing good about suffering. You see, we Christians, we've been taught by the Bible that suffering, even though we don't like it and we don't want it, we don't look for it, it can be used for good by God. It can be used in good ways, to strengthen our patience, for example, to give us humility, to give us compassion and strength and faith. In Christ, we Christians can find hope in the midst of our suffering. And we know that suffering is temporary and that our suffering has been defeated by Christ. So when we suffer, we're not losing hope like the Buddhist who realizes that when they suffer, they have to start over. Now, folks, if I needed to start over every time I suffer, 
You follow me? That's a lot of starting over. That's a miserable life. And I thought long and hard about this this week, and I want to talk to you, maybe even some of you who are watching online, because this is real, it's really heavy stuff to think about. Because if you're not a Christian and you're dabbling in things like Hinduism and Buddhism and you're suffering like the rest of us and there's somebody out there telling you that all you need to do is try again to eliminate this suffering, I'm beginning to wonder if this is having an impact on the rise of suicide. And what scares me is how many young people, I'm talking about young, I'm talking about teenagers, even some earlier than their teen years, who are contemplating suicide. And when someone talks to them, they say, well, I've messed up, life is terrible, my life is over. I'm like, dude, you're 10. Right? But for them, they're being told, you can try again. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just wondering about that. Think about it. Which brings me to this topic of eternity. Again, we both believe that we will live forever. But we believe that you only get this one life, bro. Don't, don't, don't take your life. Don't end your life. You're not going to be able to start over. You don't get a redo. You don't get a mulligan. You don't get to try again. There's no reincarnation. This is your life. It's a gift from God. And you're going to fail and you're going to suffer. But the grace of God, the power of the love of God is there for you, man. Your life's not over because it messed up. Or even if somebody did something to you and victimized you and hurt you and you feel like there's no worth in living, I'm telling you there is worth in living because this life that you've been giving is given to you as a gift from God and this life is temporary. It's not the end. When it's over, you enter into eternity. So thankfully, as bad as it is, it is temporary. It is short. Hang in there. Because we can teach you so much on how to redeem this life and restore this life and put this life back together. Don't consider reincarnation. It's a lie. It's a scam. And it's one that you can't, once you find out it it was a lie, it's too late, you see. In fact, here's a question you might ask. And this is only if you've built the relationship and the rapport, but you might ask someone, how many lives do you think you've already lived? It's a fair question. How many lives do you think you've already lived? And the follow-up to that is, so how close are you right now to being perfect? I think it's a fair question based on your theology. How close are you to never even having a bad thought, much less or much more any of the other things, right? Right? Are you sure this is the path you want to stay on? Do you really think you're going to earn nirvana one day? So let me talk about holy men. You follow Buddha, I follow Jesus. Jesus claims to be God and sinless from day one because he is God, was God, always will be God. And if Jesus is truly God, he cannot lie. And Jesus affirmed the whole Bible, and so therefore I believe the Bible is true. He affirmed it, because if he's God, he cannot lie. And he claimed also to be the exclusive way of salvation. He said no man can be saved apart from him. So I believe in a holy man, a holy man named Jesus. And you believe in a holy man. Remember, we're talking about common ground. So don't judge my holy man because you believe in a holy man named Buddha. But here's the, one of the big differences. Buddha is simply your example. Buddha's not with you. You've never met him. He will not come to you, into your life. But you follow him. You've never met him, but you follow him. 
So your religion is as much about faith as mine is, right? The only difference is Jesus has actually come into my life, and I know him personally. Now, I know you, that may sound strange to you if you've never experienced it, but we Christians have experienced it. We call him the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is in our lives. He walks with us and talks with us. And he's more real to us than even our neighbor or our friend or our spouse. God is with us all the time. He didn't just become our example. He is our Savior. Amen? He didn't just say, walk this way. He says, I'm going to carry you this way. I'm going to get you there. Amen? It's not up to you. It's up to me. That's what Jesus says. He's extremely different from a Buddha. He's not just my example. He's my Savior. Buddha claims you can save yourself. Jesus was way more honest with us and said, no, you can't. You're a sinner. You'll always be a sinner. Everything about you is, is corrupt with sin. Even your motives are corrupt with sin. And so you need forgiveness and a Savior. And you can't earn my forgiveness and you can't earn my salvation. Jesus said, I'm going to give it to you as a free gift. And it's called grace. And he took your sin and my sin and he died on the cross for it. He paid for it. So therefore he can forgive it. And he offers you forgiveness and salvation today. And I want to end with these scriptures from the book of Acts that we are Diving deep into Acts 17, 31, Paul warned those pagans in Athens that Jesus is God and that Jesus will return one day to judge everyone. And he said the following in Acts 17, 31, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and that is Jesus. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And I would quote that scripture and say that is proof that there is a God and that he's personal. He knows who you are. He's keeping track of everything in your life. He's moral. He's going to judge you based on what you've done and haven't done. So there is a God. There is a God. But I love this verse 30. God commands all people everywhere to repent. Now when you read that, it may sound like a harsh warning, because it is a warning. God commands all people everywhere to repent because there's judgment day coming in your life. And Jesus will be your judge. That is a warning, a sober warning. But it's not just a warning, it's a gracious invitation Look at it closely. He's saying you can repent. He's commanding you to repent. God is giving you right now the choice to turn away from that which is false and fake and hopeless and turn away from your sin. You can't overcome it. You can't stop it. But if you'll just turn your heart away from it to God and say, God, take over my life. Be my God and be my Savior. That is a grand and glorious invitation to repent. That's what the word repent means. Turn around and go to God, friend. Go to God. His name is Jesus Christ. Let me end by saying right now, I would like to invite you. If you would like to trust in Jesus as your Savior, you can do so right now. Maybe you're watching at home. Right where you are right now. God knows you, he cares about you, and you can become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, to follow Jesus, you've got to stop following everything else. It's exclusive. There's only one God, one way. Are you willing to do that? You say, how do I do it, Pastor? Well, it's very simple. The Bible teaches that in order to be saved, you simply ask God, the true God, Jesus Christ, to save you. Just ask him right now in your heart. Say, God, if you're real, please forgive me of my sins and take over my life. I want to follow you exclusively. I want to live for you. 
I can't do it in my own strength. I need you to come in and be my God, my Savior, my strength, my hope, my help, my healing, my all in all. And I'm telling you today, my friend, if you open your heart and you talk to God that way, he will send his Holy Spirit. God himself will come into your heart, into your life, and he'll take over. And that's salvation. Salvation's not a plan. Salvation's not a program. Salvation is a person. And if you have Jesus, you have salvation. Ask him into your heart right now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning, a joyful, celebratory morning of our God and Savior Jesus Christ and his grace and mercy in our lives. We sung these great, wonderful songs to lift up your name and to rehearse our commitment to follow you by faith because of your grace. And so God, it's been good. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord today with our eternal family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray for all those that you're drawing into this family, sinners just like us. You're forgiving them. And you're adopting them into your family. And you're giving them eternal salvation today. And you're giving them hope to live. To live. To face another day. To see their suffering in a whole different perspective. To have hope in Jesus Christ. And to see the power of his grace and healing come into their life. To put pieces back together. And to give them reasons to live. And to press on. Why? Because they're no longer, we're no longer living for ourselves. We're living for the glory of God. And with that comes great joy and peace and liberation. So God, we celebrate that today. And we pray for all of those who are giving their life to Christ this morning. May you bring them in and bring them to us. That we may encourage them. And teach them how to walk the way of Christ. For it is in his name we pray. Amen.